Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 22nd Bear <coughs> County Board of Commissioners meeting. <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to uh, ask Commissioner Couch if he would lead us in an invocation. It's my honor. Gracious, loving Lord, we are grateful to have this opportunity to be here, Lord, and just know that we are people of faith and that we know that your inspiration guides us. And as we operate in our lives with the golden rule, we also operate in our lives, Heavenly Father, that to help those who can't help themselves is your calling and our calling as well. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings in each and every life in here. We ask that you help inspire us to do what is right and what is good in your eyes in this meeting as you have put us in the charge uh, of a leadership position here and representing people uh, and to be their voice. We are your voice through our voices and their voice through your voice and ours. Amen. 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 May we have the pledge. <clears throat> Hang on. <laughs> I am here to do this. Oh, I'm sorry. If you'd like. Hey, we can have two. We can have two. Yeah. We're going to do two. Uh, uh, so Jody, I'm You can't have enough. I didn't I'm, see you in the audience, so I apologize. And so I had a mask on, which may be harder to see. I uh, wonder what okay. yeah. Yeah. Please be seated. Let's let the Reverend Moore uh, give us uh, a double whammy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Really can't ever get enough prayer amen that is and, right and, and i also understand uh to keep uh you and your family and our prayers following your Thank you. so, I appreciate it. let us pray dear god you are the creator of us all we pray for your spirit to bring us together as we celebrated president's day yesterday we pray for our president and for all the presidents who have served our nation faithfully over the years we pray for all of our elected officials for their role in working toward the common good, our national, state, and local officials, particularly for our county commissioners here in Dare County. Give them wisdom and a sense of justice and compassion for the decisions they face, not only in this meeting, but throughout the year. We continue to pray for all of our frontline workers who have been serving faithfully in the battle against COVID-19. We lift up our local medical personnel for all of their dedication and commitment during these stressful times. We give thanks for our teachers and local school officials who provided care to the county students in a time that's required great flexibility. And we pray for all of our county employees for the ways that they serve and work together for our common good. We do pray for those who are grieving, for the death of loved ones, those whose hearts are heavy with grief. And we pray for the specific deliberations at today's meeting. Be with all those who are speaking and give all of us ears to listen carefully and respectfully. We pray for the projects to provide for beach nourishment. Here in Dare County, there is a desperate need for more for affordable housing. And we pray for the discussions and the concrete steps that are being explored as the county seeks a partner for that affordable housing. Be with those who are now looking for their own place to own or to rent and are having difficulty finding somewhere affordable to live. Also, we pray for the homeless and are grateful for our community efforts through Room in the Inn and other efforts to support our local homeless population. May all the decisions that are made today promote righteousness and love. Amen. 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 Thank you, Robert Moore. Um, we're always blessed to have the Ministerial Association do a invocation for us at each one of our meetings and um once again reverend moore thank you for being here i apologize for not seeing you out there this evening <clears throat> with that being said may we stand for the pledge one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all <clears throat> Clerk, uh, <coughs> please make the record known that all are present uh, this evening. Uh, uh, Commissioner House is joining us virtually. Uh, Commissioner House, can you hear me? I sure can, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. County Manager? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Item one on the agenda is the Chairman's opening remarks. <clears throat> Thank you, County Manager. I just have two items. 
um, this evening. <clears throat> the candy bomber has passed away. 101 years of age. Incredible. Gail Haverson, the beloved candy bomber who dropped treats to German children during the Berlin airlift and then recreated that event in Manio. Every Christmas season has died this past Fe February 16th in Utah. Like I said, he was 101 years of age. News of his passing was conveyed to the voice by his dear friend Karen Edmund, who was a child in Berlin during the airlift and the recipient of Halverson's kindness. She became, she became instrumental in ar arranging ha Halverson's annual Christmas candy drop travels right here in Dare County that started back in 1999. Halverson was unable to make the trip this past year, but the event went on without, with, with Halverson's youngest son, Mike, who represented him. Edmund told the voice that she had spoken to Halverson very shortly before his death. I'm told that this will continue in Dare County, which is uh, quite impressive. Also, uh, we mourn the loss of these young individuals and victims um, recently, uh, the young uh, children, that, young teenagers that were hunting uh, in Hyde, and uh, we certainly, um, we want to mention them, 67-year-old pilot Ernest Durwood rolls out of Greenville, Jeffrey Worthington rolls 28 out of Greenville, uh, Stephanie Ann McGinnis, Fulcher, 42, was from sea level North Carolina. Jonathan McGinnis was 15 years of age out of sea level North Carolina. Douglas Hunter Parks was 45 from sea level North Carolina. Noah Starone was 15 out of Cedar Island. Michael Daly Shepard was 15 out of Atlantic North Carolina. And Jacob Taylor was 16 after, uh, out of Atlantic North Carolina. If you saw the picture that was posted in The Voice, what an incredible picture. They were sitting in that duck blind, Commissioner Tobin, when uh, yeah. it was just an unbelievable shot. And just hours later uh, in that plane crash, I'd like for us all to take a few moments in silence to um, uh, recognize Gail Haverson and these individuals who lost their lives in the recent plane crash. Thank you. County Manager? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. That brings us to item two on the agenda. That's public comment. Ladies and gentlemen, now's the time that's been set aside for public comment. If you have public comment this evening and you've not signed up, raise your hand. I'll recognize you. When I do, please come to the podium, state your name and where you're from. Um, you have five minutes. Uh, green light will come on when your time begins. There's a yellow light on the podium that will come on when you have about a minute left. And when the red light comes on, you need to conclude your remarks. Uh, on the sign-up sheet, uh, first I have uh, John Espinoza. Welcome this evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Espinoza. Uh, uh, I'm a resident uh, in this county since 2000. Uh, I live in Kildare Hills and. Um, uh, I was going through the agenda that you guys have, and I was thinking my issue maybe won't be that important, but um, I was thinking through it, and I think it is, uh, because it's about our children. Um, when I came uh, in the United States in uh, 2000, uh, I came here with my son, and I started coaching soccer uh, since then. And 
My son, he's 35 years old, and I'm coaching my grandkids now. And um, it's been a long, a long run. Uh, I want to say something about soccer in, in our country. Uh, it is getting a big deal. Uh, you're probably aware of it. Uh, the women, they, wo they won the World Cup twice, I believe. And, and the, the guys, they're not doing, uh, I mean, they're doing great as well. And on our community, I, uh, I saw how soccer grew exponentially. Uh, when I was just coaching my son, the parents, they used to say good job when the kids were kicking the ball away. <laughs> and, and that was the experience back then. But now I have to say that it grew exponentially because it's a, it's a big talent our kids are getting really good and uh, in our schools are a witness of that. Uh, First Fly High School had the, the State Cup and many other trophies. They're winning the conference every year and so many as well. Uh, The reason I'm here, and I have a few parents with me uh, uh, present, uh, is because we have uh, we don't have anywhere to to train. Um, I'm here as a coach, as a parent, and as a player. And you're probably aware of the situation. Uh, Naxed Soccer Complex they close the complex uh, for good. And we don't know when we're going to have that uh, available. And I mean, there is no explanation. It's just, it's closed. And uh, I understand that there's many issues and it's, it's not easy to take care of the grounds, especially if you know how to deal with, with them. That seems to be the reason. That's why the, the fields were in that condition. Um, again, we don't have we don't have places to train. Uh, right now, after this meeting, I had to go and coach, and I got to go all the way to the middle school and uh, menu. They have a great facility, and we are lucky that they are supporting us, giving us the, the field to train. Uh, but uh, it's just our team, and we have many of them. And also there's many uh, adults that wish they wish to play soccer and they don't have anywhere to do it. Uh, about a month ago, we come out with, uh, we have the, the skate park in Kildare Hills that we have a hockey ring that the, the people that do hockey barely use the field. Every once in a while I can see some some people, some guys, some girls doing it. It's great. But so uh, we talked to the town in Kildare Hills, and they allow us to use the field to do soccer. So we bought our own goals, and and we have soccer there twice a week uh, for about a month. It is like a 30, 40 kids playing, and also the adults. And I mean, uh, Anyways, uh, the main th thing is that uh, we don't have anywhere to, to train and play, and that was our concern. And uh, the people in the organizations like Storm, they are aware, I mean, the board of the Storm, the Storm uh, team, they are aware of the situation. And, uh, what they said is that there, there is, there's no new, uh, good news. So, and that's all we, we hear. There's no good news. So I, I'm just... Uh, I hear Tom is run, so please. Yes, sir. Remarks. I hope that... Yes, sir. Can you 
address that, or do you want me to get with him after? Because I've got some answers for I him. can address it whenever you yeah, want. Yeah, we, 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 uh, we can address Mr. Esposito's yeah. concerns. We, we appreciate you bringing that to our attention. I'm going to ask the county manager if he'll help you. He'll address that right now and help you um, with what your concerns are. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ma Kenny, man. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> so he, he is correct. The Nags Head Field and the Kill Devil Hills Field have both closed. They'll be closed until May. They're not closed permanently. Um, our fields are used. We, the fields were built to house our programs that we did for our recreation that we provide, our soccer teams that we provide. And we, as he said, started doing that years ago, and the fields were sufficient. And they did soccer season, then the fields didn't get used. They grew back in, and by the time the next soccer season came, they're good. As he also said, our soccer programs in Dare County have grown tremendously. That's a good thing. And so we felt like that we should allow our fields to be used by whomever, and we give first priority to the programs that are run by the county. And then the travel leagues, the youth leagues, the storm, the other adult leagues, all those are allowed to use our fields, and they pretty much get used year-round. Well, it's Bermuda grass. When you dig up Bermuda grass, it grows back, and that's great, but it only grows during the warm season months. And so when you allow it to be used year-round, it gets torn up. In the summer months, it doesn't have time to heal before it gets cold again. And over years, our fields have deteriorated tremendously. Um, we brought in some experts. We brought in a guy from NC State to come look at the fields, and we've hired a consultant to come in and actually do the work. And they told us we had to get off of the fields. If we wanted to have grass on those fields, we had to get off the fields and let those fields heal. Um, and you have to do that every so often or else you won't have grass there. And so the choice for us was, do we play on dirt or do we play on grass? Uh, we've got a lot of money invested in those Bermuda fields. And so we're letting those fields heal. And so we've closed those fields to allow that to happen. And as soon as they heal, we'll open them back up. Uh, we want as many of these kids playing soccer or baseball or whatever else as we can because the more time they spend doing those things, the less time they have to, to get in trouble doing other things. And so we want to make the fields available, but to have them available and to have fields, you've got to give them a chance to heal. Um, we did go to the schools behind uh, First Flight uh, Middle School. There's a big open field there. Um, we offered that field up. We told the folks we would mow it, we would line it and make it where they could use it as, and practice on it. And it, it's available as all, every day. Uh, the issue there is it doesn't have lights. Um, and so this time of year, it sort of limits the use as the time changes and there'll be more time for that. Um, I asked him to look at in the budget to do some pricing for lights. And so maybe we can see how the budget goes. And if we can afford lights, maybe we light that field. And then there's another field in addition to the Nags Head field, in addition to the Kill Devil Hills field that would be available. Uh, and we'll look at that during budget time. So that's where we are. That's why it's closed. That's what we're doing. And, and you know, it'll get resolved here, but it'll take a few months to get those fields back right. How do, how do we um, how do we make folks like Mr. Esposito, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right or not, how, how do we make them aware of why the fields are closed and the options that they have that's the part that i have trouble with it is they're they they're not aware of this and, and we somehow <laughs> some way we need we need to let the public be aware even if we post a sign at the fields that are closed the reason that they are closed sure. so that the public's not Sam, will they just close the field? We don't know. And I, Mr. Esposito is not aware why why they're closed. And I, I don't know <clears throat> who he talked to or if he talked to anyone. I know that we have had inquiries. I've had inquiries. I've explained to the ones that I know about, as I've explained to you. Um, I know that Tim has had inquiries, and he's talked to the coaches and the folks as well. Again, I don't know why Mr. Espinoza was missed or why he didn't get the message, and, and we'll see what we can do to do better at that. Okay. Are you aware of that other field uh, that he spoke of, Mr. Esposito, that y'all can use not at nighttime because it's not lit, but are you aware that that field's available? Yeah, come on, come on up. Let's, let's try to wrap this up and address yes, it. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
the board of the uh, storm, they are not uh, they are not communicating with us uh, other than say that we don't have good news and we can all use these fields. And but um, I had to say something about I was listening, uh, Mr. Mr. Command County oh, Manager Al. Sir, I was listening to him and he was, I mean, three years ago, they closed one field on the soccer complex at Nax Head. And they, they, we were using just the other field. And when I saw that, I thought that was the biggest mistake that they could do. Because uh, if Mekins Field in Kildewell Hills is closed. It was closed way back because they were doing working on the towers, on the water towers. So Naxed Field was where everybody would go to play, practice, and all. The adults, the kids, everybody. And when they closed one field, because it had to be repaired, the other field was open and all the traffic was there. Everybody, hundreds of people a week. I, I mean, uh, Storm, uh, Ovisa, or Parks and Rec, and the adults. All the traffic that we had around in the whole area was going there in one field. Doing that, when they opened the other field, that field was with holes like a four inches deep. I was, I mean, I was witnessing because I, I was going there to play and to coach. So they opened the other field and closed that field to be repaired because it needed to be repaired. So it happens the same, same thing. And as a result, after three years, the two fields are worthless. So that was a, a big mistake that whoever took that decision, I think it needs to be accountable because uh, I mean, I guess they they didn't have uh, an idea of how to do this or uh, what were they going to, uh, to have? They didn't know how many people play soccer in this area or the traffic of, of the, the that was gonna be there. But anyways, that was the reason why they closed that field because uh, it was my bad management. management. We'll, all right, we'll take your comments into consideration and we, we've got a budget workshop coming up here soon we'll i'm gonna make sure that's on the agenda for us for our board to uh, look at and address thank well, you thank you mr chairman to address yeah. what he said what he told you is exactly correct we did close half right and the goal in doing that was to avoid what's happening right now which is having no fields for anybody so the thought was close half a field, get it fixed it allowed these groups an opportunity to continue playing because we had half the field working we then closed the other field and get it right and, and we didn't have to close everything all at one time to avoid <coughs> exactly the problem that you're here tonight to talk to us about that did not work and he is right that that exacerbated the problem but the goal was to try to make the fields available we now know you can't do that hence we've closed all the fields because you can't open them halfway and so that's how we got where we are now Okay. Thank you, County Manager. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yes. So the, the good news is I talked to um, the um, Parks and Rec director before I came to this meeting, and he tells me that they've got three more fields that are going to come online behind the middle school, and they also have the two that are, are being repaired. They're coming online in May. So you, you got good news coming to you. It's just not here right this minute. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Uh, next on my list is Reese Stecker. Welcome this evening, Reese. Thank, Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Reese. Thanks, Reese. My name is Reese Stecker. Thank you for letting me come tonight to talk to you 
Uh, tomorrow in New Bern, North Carolina, the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission is meeting to discuss the striped bass uh, FMP fisheries management plan. It starts tomorrow. It's our first chance to fix quota allocation inequities in years and years and years. Uh, did you know that the North Carolina striped stri bass quota, it's split right down the middle 50-50 between the commercial guys, the netters, and the recreational guys, you know, the rod and reel group. Uh, the 50% that is split between the recreational anglers is split right down the middle, 25%, 25% to between the Albemarle Sound Management Area, ASMA, and the Roanoke Rapids Management Area, RRMA. Uh, we both get 25%. Back in February, there is a new biologist by the name of Dr. I think it's Pete Cornegie, and thank God he did it out of order and he didn't follow the process, but according to him, the populations collapsed. And we had a 10-year moratorium that was on, on the table that we got lucky and survived. But through that process, we had some major cuts in our quota that started this year. Um, I want to show you real quick a map that gives you an idea. I'm just going to walk it by you guys. The Albemarle Sound covers 667,674 acres, and it's a six-month season that we are part of. The Roanoke Rapids River Management Area is 6,420 acres. They used to have a one, a three week season. It's gone down to one week, but real quick, I'm going to walk you by this. And it's like comparing a basketball to a gum ball. You see Albemarle Sound. This little sliver right here is the run around. It snakes up here, but it's a giant mass of water versus, and I don't have a whole map. I tried to find one, but it zigzags up here. Albemarle Sound. Mm -hmm. Roanoke River, this yep. little pencil line, same exact poundage quota. It's been going on for years. The Roanoke Rapids catch season takes place on the spawning grounds during the spawn. This is the only place on planet Earth where they allow that. Uh, you can't, if you get caught <laughs> fishing on the spawning grounds and keeping a fish on the Susquehanna Flats or in the Hudson River, you go to jail. Anyhow, I've run a charter boat full time and fish the waters of the Albemarle Sound since 1997. We see something totally different on the water. I mean, we had it unbelievable fishing back in the late 90s, early 2000s. We may, we, we may never see that again. But what we've had the last half dozen years, I would call pretty good fishing. We catch them in all different kinds of weather. The weather plays a big role, but especially the fall fishing, it doesn't matter which way the wind is blowing, we catch them. And I didn't even realize Greg was here in the back. Maybe you came to support me, but he fishes a lot. He can tell you there's plenty of fish around. Uh, if it's deemed by the MFC that there is indeed a problem, the solution is a no brainer. The solution starts with the elimination of the quota going to Roanoke Rapids. As mentioned, it's the only place in America that, that allows a season during the spawn. I've already given you the figures on the 667,674 acres versus 6420. We have a six month season. They have a one to three week season. The Albemarle Sound, what I just showed you, it is 104 times larger than the Roanoke Rapids management area. Same quota. We've been getting ripped off for years. We finally got a chance to do this. I talked to Jim. I posted. We went to the Currituck County Commissioner's meeting last night. They're talking about drawing up a resolution. We've already made contact with Bertie County. We're trying to get Perquimans and Pasquotank and Camden and Terrell counties. Anyhow, our quota was cut here in Dare County by 81.376%. It went into effect on January 1st. We came in on the recreational side. And this has nothing to do with the commercial side. We're not after commercial quota. So I want to be, go on record. We want no parts of that. We came in under quota 4,000, 
546 pounds in 2021. The Roanoke Rapids management area came in 14,742 pounds over quota. And then part of this plan coming up, Wildlife Resources is the branch that, that, that has to do with running. They want more quota. They caught, they caught double their quota. Any rate, uh, dead discards. Death, dead discards are fish that die that don't even count against the quota. Roanoke Rabbits had 11,982 dead discards in 18. They had 11,980 and 19. We only had 8,002. They, they had more dead discards, which don't even count against their quota. Tucker, you're way over your time. Yeah. Okay. Well, to sum it up, what we're asking for is you look through this, what, what I've given you, and, and, and this data, and the resolution is to ask the MFC, along with the other counties, that the quota allocation is based on it can either be based on water area, water mass, or six months versus three weeks, spawn versus not spawn. It's it's our first chance in 25 years to fix this. And there's I know I'm over I know I'm over limit, but it supports one little city in Roanoke. It's all about money. It's not about the resource. Currituck, Camden, Pasquotank, Perquimas, Washington, Bertie, Terrell, and Derrick County. You got eight different counties. We need help. We're up against the we're up against the money in Raleigh that wants to keep fishing there. We need you guys' help, and we, and we hope that y'all do the resolution. <laughs> Sorry about talking so long. No, thank you, Reese. Um, I, I know Commissioner House is on the on the uh, uh, virtually. Um, I know Commissioner Tobin, you posted yeah. on there um, uh, comment. I posted. I'm not sure if some of our other fellow commissioners posted, but we're certainly uh, poised to uh, do a resolution. Uh, Commissioner House, have, have you uh, uh, have you addressed? I, I know you're on top of this. Have you uh, done any um, thing with respects to a, a petition, a, a resolution concerning this? I haven't. No, I haven't done anything as, as pertaining to resolution. For I've been talking to a few of the uh, uh, commissioners on the Marine, uh, Marine Fisheries uh, Commission, and um, the problem we're running into is striped bass. Uh, this FMP had a scoping session that was in November 2nd through November 15th of 2020 is when all of this should have been brought to light to them. At this point in time, um, they're kind of strapped. Um, now, the Wildlife Commission, uh, actually, they requested a three-way split of the allocation of being one-third Rona, one-third Albemarle, and one-third uh, commercial fishery, and that was shot down immediately uh, by the Marine Fisheries Commission, and so they started moving <laughs> forward with uh, what they're what they're working on now. Um, now the vote that they're going to take uh, this week is a vote of to open it up for public comment and feedback, and will be set for the commission to meet in August, meeting to finalize the FMP. So we have some time to work with this. Oh, okay. Good. So, um, but uh, definitely putting putting together a resolution to help uh, you know support what we've got. I, I'm I'm all for that. Um, I just want to let you know that um, trying to put it under the gun this fast is going to be kind of hard. And also, I've talked to a lot of the uh, a couple of the uh, biologists at the Marine Fisheries Commission. I actually talked to one of them today. And for them to do a change at this point in time, uh, the commission, since it's already on their agenda, would have to kick it back to them and would delay the FMP out for about another six to six months, which I don't think the uh, Wildlife Commission or the Marine Fisheries Commission is going to allow that to happen um, because they're under time, time constraint to get an FMP uh, revitalized. Um, so like I said, we're, we're under the gun. Um, I'm not opposed to putting a resolution together and, and putting out a con, uh, consorted front, but I just wanted to make, make you aware that what they're voting on is the FMP so that it can go for public comment and also feedback. They're not actually making a vote to say this is what it is. So, so we have some time to draw this resolution in opposition to 
Uh, is that what you're saying? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, one thing I would add, I talked with the Curry Tuck manager today, and so okay. he was looking, if you all have a sample resolution, yeah, since you know that, if you can share that with the managers in all those counties, we can expedite that. It's simpler for us because we don't know all those details that you know. Well, I talked to Kathy Rawls this morning for probably 30 minutes, and I just talked to Commissioner. I've, I've talked to a couple of commissioners in the last couple of days. The important thing is it's got to be, and I and y'all have all these rules, but the reallocation has to be, reallocation on a recreational quota has to be added to the draft plan for the agenda as an FMP option. I think that's the way I understand it. And apparently it's late. They already, MFC tried to do that to get more for Roanoke, which is crazy. But and I, and I got denied, but this hasn't been on the table and we've got the facts. We got the facts, the figures, the, the evidence is there. You know, I mean, they've had 182,000 dead discards since 1997 in Roanoke Rapids. We've only had like 53,000. I mean, and, and those aren't even fish to count against the quota. So according to Kathy and according to Tom, who I talked to right before I walked in the meeting, if we can get that on, I don't know, I'm going to need some help drawing it up or somebody. Yeah. We've we, we got to figure it out, but it's got to be. If you write it in a letter form, what you want, I'll turn it into a, a resolution yeah, you'll, form. You'll make magic. Yeah, I'll, I'll, That's yeah. right. I'll <laughs> fix it up. You give it to us in a letter <laughs> form, we'll, we'll, we'll get the resolution. And and, and uh, it's it's on your page. Paul Beaumont, I believe, right. is the one in Kurtak, and I can't remember the guy's name in Bertie that we just made contact with. But we're hoping everybody, I mean, we need help. We're up against a machine. Anyhow, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Reese. We will do what we can to help you guys. Appreciate it. And their allocation is during spawning season. So that's right. That can't season. be, I mean, yeah. that's. And then. <laughs> yeah. Guys, I, I don't know much about fishing, but it feels like I'm listening to this and we've crossed over to the other side of the looking glass. We're going to give an enormous quota to fish during spawning season. I'm not a fisherman. I don't know much, but I know enough that you don't do that. No. So I don't understand this bizarre logic. I I, I mean, I appreciate what Reese just told us, but I, I mean, it leaves me speechless. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, okay. Can't imagine uh, next, we have Rick Shafton. Good evening, Rick. Thanks for being Good here. evening, and thank you all for having me here this evening. Um, we had a Republican meeting last week. A couple of issues came up, and I thought I'd come here to thank Commissioner Bateman for stopping by and for the rest of you. I want to kind of go over a couple of issues. First, it was a discussion of affordable housing. And one of the things that everybody kind of feels on the island anyway is needed is not year-round housing, it's summer housing. And some of the, one of the, and I'll just throw this to you guys to consider, one of the ideas that was thrown to me was uh, trailers. Because a lot of people I know who are lower income on the island live in a whole bunch of different trailer parks on the island there. And uh, so that was where that idea came from. So I just throw that to you. Um, with the uh, the new bridge that's opening up shortly, uh, there's a lot of concern about what the name will be because uh, the previous bridge naming, people on the island felt there was no input, that it was decided by Roy Cooper and his liberal friends at the <laughs> Department of Transportation. And there's a concern that this bridge will also get some kind of woke name, the first transgender surfer or something. And and uh, so what people want to, first off, one thing I'm getting from people is that people don't want the bridge named after anybody, something like we've got, what we had at the meeting were uh, Hatteras Island Bridge, Rodanthe Jug Handle Bridge, Jug Handle Bridge, other people said to me Chickamacomico Bridge. Uh, you know, I, I think the real concern is that it just would be politicized. People don't really want this politicized. And on the top of the bridge, one of the, the big uh, concerns is this traffic circle because it's, it's only one lane, it's very narrow, um, there's no room to bike around it. Um, but the biggest problem is that you're going to have a whole bunch of people come down here who have never seen a traffic circle before. And on 2.30 on Saturday afternoon, somebody is going to come to a complete stop. They are going to panic. And they're not going to know what to do. They're going to stop, and the bridge is going to be backed up for two, three miles. 
And, and I lived in a place that had that problem. So I know what that's about. And uh, I mean, right away, I think you're gonna have to have a sheriff's officer down there on Saturdays, waving people through. But the solution that seemed to make the most sense is why isn't there a merge lane right off the bridge? Those of us who live north of the bridge, we already have to stop at the end of our streets. So we don't mind stopping. I mean, we're gonna stop for all these people anyway. I mean, actually the original idea with the stop sign probably was better because this thing is just, it's too narrow and there's gonna be, somebody's gonna get stuck in it. So that's the concern with that. And then the final thing, which is something I've observed uh, driving back and forth, is that some of these mile markers are just bizarre on these signs. I mean, there's one south of Salvo that says Rodanthe's eight miles away, but Rodanthe's like four miles away, five miles away. But, and then the ones anybody's driven 64 coming in, those signs haven't been changed since the Virginia Dare Bridge opened. So it's like you'll have signs that say uh, 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 Cape Hatteras Seashore, 17 miles when you're 12 miles from it, you know? So uh, just something else I mentioned, and I don't know what you guys could do in that regard. Well, we'll, we'll make NCDOT aware of your concerns. Yeah, it's just a little bit. The eight miles to Rodanthe is a little, it's just a little. Right. I think it was like they had three and five, and then somebody said three plus five is eight. They put eight instead <laughs> of. So anyway, thank you, and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Any other public comment tonight? Yes, sir. <laughs> Good evening. My name is John Robbins. I live on Roanoke Island in Mantia. A couple things. Um, my daughter played traveling soccer. I don't know if any of y'all had anybody on a traveling soccer team. Takes you to Virginia, South Carolina. I think I went to Tennessee one time and Charlotte. But I have to say that the facilities in other smaller municipalities are much nicer than ours. They have artificial turf that solves these problems that they're talking about. Yes, there's initial cost for the artificial turf, but the long-term management of it is very, very good. So I ask that you look at artificial turf for those things. The next thing, um, I like the Mark Bass Knight Bridge. Just don't call it the Q Bridge down there, what the, uh, these probably guys probably want. <clears throat> but um, then the uh, other thing is on affordable housing. Um, it's much needed. I choose to rent the few houses that I have. I um, Put those long-term tenants, guy that works at Bayless, another one's my trim carpenter. I would say on a basis for individuals such as me or others to incentivize them to rent it on a long-term basis, if I can show somebody in the county or the tax department I'm doing it long-term, give us a tax break. You might get more people to do that rather than just simply say, I'm just going to put it short-term rentals. Don't ban short-term rentals, but just incentivize people to rent them long-term. Next thing is, um, you know, going back, I've looked at these things, managing renters, just managing my few renters is a pain. You have a company with 700 employees. You have a company that's been doing this for over 30 years. You have a company that can tell you, this is how we've been doing it. There's a lot of paperwork that you have to guarantee. Going with a brand new company that says, we're gonna train somebody on how to do this program. What if something goes wrong? What if this company that takes it on, there's long, no long-term incentive. They find out that the money's not there. What do you do? Don't, in that situation, Dare County is going to be forced to manage this. It's going to cost taxpayers money. You have nothing. And then you set up all these umbrella shell organizations, and they're all managed differently. If something goes wrong, the shell companies don't really have that much many resources to go after. You have a company over here that has been doing this for 30 years, that has resources that you can go back and say, y'all did something wrong. We're gonna try to regroup coop some of our money. This shell organization, <clears throat> this one over here, then this one over here, this one over here, good luck tracking that. And if something goes wrong, <laughs> who do you go to? And if it, it will end up being managed by Dare County. If Brindley, whomever says there's no money in it, has a taxpayer, has people that are trying to solve this problem, we're screwed. The next thing is the 4% income and getting that reoccurring government funds. Don't give that up. Don't give that up. We can, I mean, they say, oh, well, the government system's so complex. Well, that was from one group that was formed in the past year. The other group with 30 years of experience, they've navigated this. 
It's like a shit, uh, you know, do you want a captain going through Oregon Inlet that's been doing it for 30 years? Or do you want somebody that just formed a little, you know, charter business and is going to just say, you know, I know how to do it. I've got this chart and I'm going to train the captain how to do it. You're going to have hiccups. The next one is, um, you know, is just again back to the umbrella. If something goes wrong, building houses, building apartments, doing this project, it's taken so long because it's so complex. And if you look at it and say, you know, well, you know, we're going to go with this one group because, you know, maybe they wear camouflage. Maybe they come in here and do things. Maybe they, you know, I don't know. But you have this one group with all these resources. If something does go wrong, they've handled it in the past. They've seen it in the past. <clears throat> in closing, just some of my notes. I mean, I applaud both groups to come in before you. But th this has been a program that's going to have to be long term for Dare County. And we can't afford I've got three friends right now that they can't find a place to live. One of them does um, canvas on, a, on boats. The other one is a carpenter that's lived down here since the 80s. Um, they can't find, another one does the glass um, in houses, showers, and they can't find any place. I don't have anything to rent to them. I've called other people in this room. I mean, it's just to go with the unknown. I mean, it's like if, something goes wrong, you want the best surgeon to operate on you. We need the best surgeon with 30 years of experience doing solving this problem, not somebody that just graduated from medical school. And again, I'm sure that they do a good job in other, their other things, but this is complex and we need the best and Dare County deserves the best. And I give this guy a uh, artificial turf soccer field. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, <coughs> any other public comment? Anyone else like to speak at public comment? Anyone in Buxton like to speak at public comment? No comment from Buxton. With that, Mr. Chairman, we would move on to item three, <laughs> and this is a Bright Spring Health Services update. I think we have uh, Michael Calder on here. Thank you for agreeing to be here this evening, uh, Michael. Appreciate it. Absolutely. My name is Michael Calderon. I'm the Vice President of Operations with its Advanced Home Health, or as we operate here in Dan Dare County, Adoration Home Health. My name is Mickey Antley. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing and Business Development for what, North Carolina. What, what is that again, Nick? You said it really quick. Senior Director of uh, Market Development. Business and your name, sir? Mickey Antley. Mickey Antley. Thank you. Sir. We've got some slides that we put together. Okay, great. Okay. Looks like they're loading up, but appreciate the board's uh, opportunity this evening. Appreciate those you know viewing at home for us to provide an update on how the operation is going. Um, just just to remind everyone, this was an acquisition under Bright Spring at the start of September, September first of 2021. Um, Mickey and myself are not Bright Spring employees. We are actually employees of uh, a service line of Bright Spring, which is Advanced and Adoration Home Health. So together. Um, we oversee the operations of 13 local home health agencies across North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, as we wait for these slides to come up, just a couple of things to know. Um, we have, uh, I know hospice, I think it was a few months back, was, was here to present a, an update on their operations. For us, this is strictly around home health, although Mickey does oversee the operational, uh, the sales side. Uh, of, excuse of me, Mr. Calderon. Yes. You're saying hospice is not part of what we'll talk about with you tonight? Not this evening. No, sir. I was that asked is extremely to present unfortunate. Home yeah. I have been waiting yeah. several months to address the topic of hospice. I, I apologize for that, sir. I, I, I was actually reached out to provide only a home health update because previously Re hospice reached out. Who, who reached out to you, sir? Um, do you I know? Can, I can go back and look. Dorothy, do you know who? I don't. That is, that is was, extremely I unfortunate. Was, I thought it was clear with especially with the last uh, time we had someone here, that that was a very, very um, huge concern of ours with respect to hospice and that we would be brought uh, uh, up to uh, speed on, on what's happening with hospice uh, in Dare County. And I apologize for that. It was actually, I've been communicating through, it, it's Cheryl Anby. So when we were supposed to have had our hospice update for the person that was supposed to do it 
for whatever reason. I can't hear you, Bobby. I said when we were supposed to have our hospice update previously, the person who was supposed to have presented that for whatever reason, I don't remember the reason, wasn't able to come. And we sought to reschedule that because yes, and yeah. they were coming back. When these folks called and said we we're coming in February, then we scheduled them to come in February with under the assumption they were coming back to give us the report on the whole operation. That's a reasonable that, assumption. That was what right. our assumption was. Um, and so I, where the disconnect came, I, I know the local person at hospice knew we were looking for that because we talked to her and she came and apologized and said they would have our update. So, well, in fairness to these gentlemen, if they weren't made aware of that, I mean, I certainly want to hear what they have to say, but you need to go back and make it very, very clear that we want to report is sooner rather than later with respects to uh, hospice and, and DARE. Are, are you even familiar with the issue that we are concerned about that caused this board's request for our, uh, a review in depth? Sir, I, I apologize. Like, as I said, I, I work operations for home health. No, and I, I accept I, I'm, that. So I'm not fine. aware. I'm not criticizing you in any way. I'm just asking, were you even aware? I, of I'm, I'm not aware. In well, fact, then this is a major swing and a miss. We've been waiting. I've been waiting for weeks. Well, and, and that's understandable. And we'll, we'll, we'll address it, Commissioner. But right now, out of respect for them, we need to be brought up to date on... on uh, yeah, absolutely. They, and, and I apologize for the community for the, the miscommunication. This is absolutely but something if, I'll if, bring to the hospice leadership team. If you will, if you will relay to, to Bright absolutely. Springs our concerns, in addition, we'll have our clerk contact Bright Springs. We need we need this sooner rather than later with respect to hospice because we had some issues. Yeah, and, and, and I and I don't have a problem to reach back out to Cheryl and just initially I was reached out to to provide the home health update. So somewhere along the lines with that being a miscommunication, we we can look to get to the bottom. Right. Of that. Yes, sir. Uh, Matt, are we able to? Uh, thank there you. There we go. All right. Appreciate that. So as as we know, the acquisition occurred as of September first, two thousand and one. At that time, on the home health side of things, we did have. Um, 11 patients on our census, and we had four full-time staff members that were working um, with home health. So we're we're happy to say we have since grown both staffs to the point where there was some overlap on home health and hospice operations where we had nursing staff that were seeing both patients under those service lines. We've had um, a lot of success locally recruiting nursing and therapy staff to the point where we've been able to grow the home health um, local full-time operation to 11 full-time staff members, including uh, a full-time staff member on the sales and marketing team that is coordinating referrals for both the, uh, the, the home health and the hospice side of things, along with three additional PRN staff members. So we started with five, and locally we've grown that off, that, that this operation on the home health side to currently four, 14 staff. Um, some just local office updates our ACHC site survey did occur on January 21st, which is when ACHC comes and, and just reviews your operation to make sure you do have a physical presence. You are who you say you are, and you are uh, eventually billing uh, as your operation. Uh, we have a reaccreditation survey, which window opens in April um, to close at the end of, G of June. So we anticipate them being back uh, very shortly to review our, our clinical and, and overall business compliance within uh, AC regulate, ACHC regulations. Uh, and just uh, a quick update to the board in regards to our office relocation project as we are currently um, located in the, in the Dare County offices. That has actually slowed uh, to the point where there's not a lot of viable office space for us to rent to, as a group for home health and hospice due to the square footage that we need as an operation so we've, we've kind of had to put those on pause. We've looked at the, the, the handful of locations locally where potentially um, would be viable for us to move into. With none at this time, um, we are currently working um, with the county to look at potentially what uh, a lengthening our lease and, and being in the current facility for a little bit longer, potentially through uh, as, as we're able to, to view some different spaces available in the summer and into the fall. How much, how much square footage you need for both? About 3,100 to about 4,000 square footage, sir. And that would, that would incorporate both, both sides, the home health and the hospice mm -hmm. staff. 
are you not able to find that much space or are you not able to find that much space at a price you want to pay? Um, we found actually both. It, there's been there's actually been a, a local bank, which is just a little bit outside of our square footage um, the price per square foot has been pretty reasonable at a couple other places we've looked at, but they're not up to, to 3000 square feet. I think the one we looked at was around 2100. Advance the slide, please. So just a current update as well. Um, part of the acquisition is we were able, um, we transitioned over with the current Dare County home health and hospice contracts. So you can see here the payers outside of traditional Medicare that we're currently contracted <laughs> with. And so we're a little bit limited at this time with only six other payers currently working on our contracting side to go further into that to include uh, potentially VA payers and then any med traditional Medicaid and managed Medi Medicaid payers. We currently do operate outside of these contracts via one-time agreements um, with, with certain payers uh, based off sometimes referral source uh, to make sure that we can accommodate payers that, that have a home health need. Any reason Blue Cross Blue Shield's not on that list? It is on the top of our list of negotiations currently and we're, we're working through that. That is a payer that we have success <laughs> with many times to, to provide an LOA or a one-time agreement to continue on with. That's important for us because it's a big deal down here. And, and that is, in fact, one of the problems we had on the hospice side as well that created one of the problems Commissioner Ross is concerned about. So that's an important thing for us. Yeah, I do not have an update tonight on that payer, but I can certainly follow back sure. up with that. And when we get the hospice team back, I can have them provide an update. This next slide here is, is just an overview of our total admissions on the home health side, along with our continued dedication to charity care with, within uh, our service area. So total admissions have increased. Um, for initially, we started in September. That number is not included on the slide, um, but was around 20. We have increased uh, to total admissions of 36 in October, 48 in November, 38 in December, and then 45 in January, along with a running total of 10 total uh, charity admissions. Um, which we we provide care uh, without cost. Referral volume by location. Uh, Mickey and, and the sales team have done a great job establishing some relationships within the community. Um, none for us more important or on the volume side, uh, a better partner for us than the Outer Banks hospitals. We've had 41 total referrals um, right now in four completed months in operation. And you can see other medical centers that we've been able to establish um, a consistency and a touch point. Honestly, we're a little bit overwhelmed. There are two things that, that really we were a little bit concerned with um, that have, have been part of you know, a, a big area of our success early on. One is our ability um, to find a need and really work with our referral partners and, and fill that need, certainly on the home health side, of getting out within 24 hours, establishing care for our, our patients, and then providing a service that, that certainly was going to meet their needs and satisfy their expectations. And the other one was our ability to recruit locally. Our concern was that we were potentially going to have to reach out to, to contract staff, certainly on the nursing side, where nationally there's a nursing shortage. Uh, and we've had, we've had a great deal of success with that as well. Listen. On the plus side, if you go back one slide, Matt. No, the slide that was just on the board. Okay. We'll, we'll skip that one. I was one of those referred to you by the Centera medical system in October. Okay. And I can tell you that the response, the care was excellent. Okay. Right. I had a knee replacement and they did a fine job. So I have no issues or questions. I thought the response and the treatment and the care was excellent. As county manager said, we've had a hospice issue, which we will address at the next opportunity. But given my earlier comments, I felt it was wrote to at least point out that I appreciated and the work that was done and the excellent care I received. Thank no, we, we appreciate that feedback. So we've got, a, we've got a, uh, a patient satisfaction slide coming up in a couple. So maybe maybe that, that included your input, but we'll see how that goes. Let me get our IT to back up one slide, if you will. Um, That's the slide I was looking yeah, for. I was one of the 14. Yeah, we, we've um, honestly been overwhelmed with, with the the volume and the engagement for some of our orthopedic um, referrals within the community. And tell me how that works. Peak resources. They give you, 
Why do we keep why losing? do we keep losing the slide? Peak resources, um, eight referrals. How does that work when a when an assisted living facility refers home health to you guys? Do, do they do you come to peak resources or do, are they referring somebody that's in a home that needs it's for whenever a patient goes through their skilled services at, at peak resources when they're using their med a days for therapy so say they discharge from a hospital and then they go to a sniff they're there for x amount of period and then they discharge from that facility to home that's what I, we pick those okay patients up i got you thank you that because I, I was wondering how that worked okay not sure yeah, they have their they have skilled services on site. So right. When they whenever they're on their long term care side, they use their own therapy. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, good deal. This slide, you'll just see our total patient census. As I mentioned, we transition patients from the old home health um, over to the to the new adoration home health as of September first. We had eleven on census. So we have been successful in growing that business and, and engagement through the community. We've also been able, like I said, to grow uh, internally with direct hire staff, which has given us the opportunity to continue to expand our footprint in the lives that we touch. Currently servicing up to 70 patients um, this, this week. So we hit that milestone and really excited to say that we've got the staff um, on, on currently on our team to continue to grow and, and establish more relationships and service volume. Um, yeah. That's 70 active patients that, you know, with the, with the development and hiring of, of staff, we're able to care for that many at a time. Yeah. That number's encouraging because we were in the 50 range, I believe, weren't we? Uh, County manager, weren't we close to in the 50 range? Uh, yeah. In that range. I yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Will you be addressing a slide that shows the number of patients you're turning away when requests come in and you cannot meet those needs? I, did you put that on here? I did not. So the only ones that we have turned away is one where we can't secure an LOA through the insurance. And what happens with those, and it, it, it gets tricky. So they will, if, if there's another provider in network that can service this county, and Albemarle is one of, the, one of those providers that also provides home health in Deer County. If they are in network, they will not give us an LOA if they're able to provide care. Um, the other ones that we have, to my knowledge, we haven't declined. We've, we've gone out and not admitted patients that either weren't appropriate or patients refused once we got a referral. But to my knowledge, what we've turned away is a very minimal number. I don't have that exact data, but it, it's not, I mean. Yeah, that was one of the critical uh, statistics or criteria that we used in developing our logic and conclusion that we needed to outsource this to a third party because we were not serving our county properly we were not satisfactorily meeting those needs and that was um, a very important statistic for us because people have turned not away turned down a, a, a patient in deer county that that we are able to to service okay that was my question yeah. so the yeah. zero so would it, be it, the we've answer we've actually been able to go outside of deer county into curry tuck to service on the other side of the bridge as well and that's just through staff staff growth. Okay, I got a question. So someone has Blue Cross and Blue Shield and, and has to have your services. What happens to them? So we will we will attempt to get an LOA through that insurance. And if they have tell us what an LOA is. It's a letter of agreement. It's a one time letter of agreement for a patient. So they will say, here's we will agree to pay for services for this patient for X amount of visits. But you're not accredited by Blue Cross and Blue Shield as of right now, right? We are working to finalize that contract with this NPI provider number. But as of right now, you're not a correct. Correct. Okay. That's so they we, wouldn't give you the letter of intent to take care of that patient? They will if they cannot find another provider that is in network in the area that can provide care for that patient. We've been successful in getting some of those LOAs. So are you telling us then that any patient in Dare County that comes to you, whether you've got them in your coverage pool or not will get service either you'll get it through an LOA or if you don't get an LOA someone else will service them but nobody's going without service that is eligible for service well so, some insurances will not give an LOA All right and I don't I can't I so don't. if someone comes to you from a company that will not give an LOA what happens to that patient then our our sales rep will actually try to work with another provider to get them to see that patient. So what, what then gets them into the 12 that you had that were 
free cases. So those free cases are essentially patients that, that were indigent, that did not have insurance, that needed care, that we take <laughs> on and agree with potentially that the, the hospital system, that they need a certain number of visits, we will pro provide those for your costs. Or ultimately, we go back and we thought that they had a, an insurance. Uh, turns out those visits, for, for whatever reason, were not billable. And, and essentially, we provide that care pro bono. So you're what I think I'm hearing is there's nobody that's come to you all looking for service that one way or another didn't get service from their county. We work as closely with our referral sources as possible. Now, once our, our, our sales team member then reaches out to other agencies that maybe are within network or have a contract with that insurance and we pass that along, we can't guarantee that they were serviced. But, but Mickey's staff coordinates all of those. Yes. We follow up on all to ensure. And sometimes it actually... It has worked to our advantage in certain situations that we have agencies neighboring ours that are struggling a little bit um, more with staffing. So those insurance companies have come back and agreed to do to do the letter of agreement or the one time agreement for care. OK, I believe you have satisfaction scores up here. This is, is this is a smaller number. Now, this is a, these are running totals from our first month when we were able to obtain patient satisfaction scores, which is in December for our discharge patients. But of the the CMS um, reported measures for patient satisfaction, we are we are happy to report that we are uh, meeting or exceeding the national average um, for all six uh, of those current patient satisfaction scores. Any other questions for us? No, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't. Unless my fellow board commissioners have. No, I got Commissioner um, Bateman. I want you to do me a favor, yes, and I'm gonna be. I'm going to be really, really nice. Okay. I too, as Commissioner Ross, we expected hospice to be here. That's very important to us because we've had issues. Um, what I would like for you to do, I want you to go talk to whoever you got to talk to and tell them that we want a senior. We don't want a local representative. We want a senior representative of Bright Springs here to represent hospice and to answer our questions. And we want it done in a timely fashion. The other thing is when y'all presented your company to us, one of the questions I asked and I said, are you, is anyone ever going to be denied coverage? And do you have all the insurance companies on board? I was told yes. And all of a sudden, we haven't got Blue Cross and Blue Shield, which is one of the issues that we have with the hospice. Yeah. I think one of the problems with that, sir, is, is we're so I, Well, I understand. And I, I don't need to know that right now. But it's been five months for you to get a, 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 a deal work with those guys. Five months to get them on board. Have you ever worked with payers before? It's not, not an easy I'm, process. I'm, I'm, I'm it would have been better to tell it. us, guys, before we move the deal, it could be really hard to get payers. And it's, we may have a lot of missing it's contracts. It's not exactly that. It's 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 hard. It, it is a time-consuming process. The problem is that we're, we're, dealing, we're dealing with lives here and people. So that's our business. It's that's right. Lives. And so we're not servicing, in my opinion, and doing what we said we were going to do. And I find that very concerning. Now I'll go yeah, back can, to being nice. I can assure you that we are working on every avenue. We want to grow this business and this business to be as successful as it possibly can. And that means extending our coverage and our payer contracts as, as much as we possibly can. So that is absolutely our goal and something we work on every day. All right, gentlemen. Thank you all so much. I do appreciate you all being Thank here. You. Thank you. Chairman, that brings us to item four on the agenda. And Dave Clausen will make that question. It's, it's the mystery that can't be solved, I guess. Good evening, Dave. Good evening. Um, I am back for the Town Speech Nourishment uh, Project, and I think for your budget for that project for the last time. Um, this amendment is uh, for two line items in the Coastal Protection and Engineering contract that you'll be asked to approve with your next agenda item. Um, it also, this budget amendment also covers one budget item that's not in that contract. Um, that contract includes six tasks, tasks one through four, there are no change. The actual is equal to the estimates. 
uh, task five for beach maintenance uh, plans decreases by $253 in total, but each town's amounts change differently. Uh, task six for benthic monitoring decreases in total by 60,193, as uh, the reason for that was no benthic monitoring was required in the permit issued for Killable Hills. Um, then the other budget item included is for turtle monitoring. Um, that's not part of the CPNE contract, and we'll have two separate contracts for that. Uh, it's the same entities or same person, entity and person that we contracted with for the last town's beach nourishment project. So day monitoring will be done by NEST, and night monitoring will be uh, with Christian Legner as coordinator for indiv individuals that work as uh, independent contractors. Uh, the turtle monitoring budget increases by 44000 but uh, the final number is comparable to what the last project was, 86000 versus eighty. and CP&E thinks they made a mistake in their estimate. They did, because it just doubled. They missed it by 50%, so yeah, that is, mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, the net of all each of those changes is balanced through each town's contingency line item, which increases by a grand total of $15,826. Uh, you had the budget. I did a change schedule for each of the budget lines in each of the towns. Um, you've got the Exhibit B from the CP&E contract for the Task 1 through 6. And then finally, you've got the amendment to the Capital Project Ordinance, which is what we're asking you to adopt. Thank you, Dave. Any questions of Dave? No, it's, it would look good to pack it. There's good information on that. It's thorough. Yeah, no questions here. Pleasure of the board. Motion on the floor by the vice chair to, a, Second. to approve the uh, budget amendment, uh, uh, capital project, Norton, excuse me. And it's been seconded by Commissioner Bateman. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. All right. Aye. Opposed aye. Like Motion carries unanimous. Thank you, Dave. Mr. Chairman, before we go on, my computer's yeah. gone black, and now it's came back up, and it's back up to just a blue screen. Hit, hit the button. Hit the button. Been hitting buttons, trying to get it back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mine did the same thing, but it came back. It's been flicking on and off the whole meeting. Yeah, yeah. Item five is the Dare County Beach Nourishment is contract with CP and E and, and Dustin will make that presentation. Dustin, good evening. Good evening, Chairman, Vice Chairman, members. Uh, what's in front of you is the proposal from Coastal Protection Engineering for Construction Administration and Engineering well, Services. Uh, these services are required by the permits that the regulatory agencies issued us. Um, as David just mentioned, it covers task one through six. Um, and what I'm asking for you all to do tonight is to approve the proposal and authorize the county manager to sign that proposal. Okay, any questions of Dustin? <laughs> Hearing none then, the pleasure of the board. Move to approve. There's a motion on the floor by Commissioner House to approve the Coastal Protection Engineering proposal and authorize the county manager to sign it. It's been seconded by the vice chair. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. Like, opposed like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you all. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Dustin. Chairman, items six, seven, and eight will be presented by Dave Clawson as well. Welcome back, Dave. Thank you. This is the exciting portion of your agenda for <laughs> Medicaid cost settlement and Medicaid managed care. Um, Um, I had written up this agenda item for EMS, Medicaid cost settlement. What Cheryl is handing out is for the health department Medicaid cost settlement, because that email went to the health department, and I told them instead of writing up a um, separate agenda item, which the way it works is will be exactly the same as this one, that I'd add it to this one and, and uh, ask you guys to approve the second time, budget Dave, amendment. One more time, Dave. I'm trying to follow along. Um, just go over that one more time so I can track with you. Well, I realized when I wrote up this agenda item, I made the assumption that everybody 
had in their minds what Medicaid cost settlement was. We have one that we do every year for EMS. We have one we do every year for the health department. The way it works is Medicaid allows us to bill at a certain rate. Then after the fact, we're allowed to go back and say and show that your rate provided this much revenue, but our actual cost was more than that. And then you have a settlement. Gotcha. Okay, now I'm with you. It, Thank you. it takes a long yep. time. But, but now with Medicaid managed care, that piece is picked up out of that large settlement and done separately through a separate method. And we just got the first bills from the state uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so that has started. So I'll give, I'll give the state credit. They figured out a way, a very complicated way, but a way that the net that the county will receive is going to be the same and it won't change. But we have to process it differently and budget it differently. You had me when you had me right there when you told me how the health department, which delivers service and EMS delivers service, we bill and get paid a smaller amount than actual cost, and there's a difference. Right. This says we must pay. Well, for the managed care portion, which is not EMS out, and not health. Well, no, it's for both. So you've got all the Medicaid billings. Some of those Medicaid patients are managed care patients, but not all of them. I'm looking for yeah, Commissioner Overman to ask if I'm correct. I think I'm trying to follow you. Okay. Okay. So you've got that whole Medicaid population. It's another then serpentine the, the, the or presentations serpentine you had convoluted. From, yeah, I'm, I'm the presentations to you had from Trillium, there's certain high risk Medicaid patients that they have to manage that care. That's correct. That's that small right. population. I got that. Yep. That's that small population that we're talking about here. Just that managed care that Trillium is is handling. So you've got regular Medicaid patients. So they bill the counties and the counties are paying for so, that. Right now, we receive the federal share of that settlement. For that small managed population, we now have to pay the state the non-federal share. Then the state pays us the federal and the non-federal share so that our net is the same, the federal share. Okay, so it's a circle, but we're... We're ending up in the same we're place. We're coming at the same place. We, we met out. Net zero. Yeah, it'll, it'll net come zero. to a net zero. All right. Yeah. Okay. Got and that's going to work Thank the you. same for EMS. Yeah. Okay. Which we gave you a budget amendment for just a flat hundred thousand right. dollars because we have no idea what the numbers are going to be, and the one we just handed out is for the health department, and that's fifty thousand dollars because we don't know what the numbers are going to be. Okay. And the third part of what we're asking is, do you allow the county manager to, to execute future budget amendments? for these two items, as long as the revenue and the expense it's are the same. Because they're sending us invoices right. and quarterly and we're gonna have like two weeks to respond. So, so our, that's our uh, request is to approve, approve the budget amendment for EMS, approve the budget amendment for the health department and allow the county manager to make uh, balanced amendments from this point on. So moved. I uh, motion on four by the vice chair, second. Yeah, I second it. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Tobin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. aye. Motion carries unanimous. All right, item seven is the audit contract for this fiscal year. Um, it is attached, it is with Potter and Company. Uh, this is the fourth year of a four year agreement with Potter and Company. The price is $70,000. Uh, that's a 1.82% increase. Our four-year agreement with them allowed for a 2% annual increase. Um, what we're asking is for you to approve the contract, authorize the chairman and Commissioner Ross as uh, chairman of the audit committee to execute the contract. Motion to approve. Second. I'll second. Okay, motion on the floor by Commissioner Bateman has been seconded by Commissioner Couch. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. Opposed like sign. Motion carries unanimous. All right, thank you. Um, 
Okay, item A, um, use of the American <coughs> Rescue Plan grant. Um, <coughs> the county was awarded $7,188,564 of American Rescue Plan, and these funds are called local physical recovery funds, or state and local physical recovery funds. We got the first half of that amount on May 20th of last year. We should get the second half on just about the same day this year. Um, any interest earned on those funds has to be spent per the grant requirements. Um, the big change that has happened is the final rule for all this um, grant funds got issued uh, last month in January. Uh, it contained a, a, a significant change, which was every unit of government that's gotten this grant is now allowed to assume a revenue loss of $10 million. So if you've got $10 million or less, you can make an irrevocable choice to say we had a revenue loss, even though we didn't. Um, and that changes the rules. Um, so our recommendation and ours is your purchasing agent and Sally and myself and the county manager. Um, first, that we follow UNC School of Government recommendations to local governments, all of them receiving 10 million or less. And they advise that um, a local government's fully allowed to supplant <laughs> existing local government revenue sources for any eligible general government services. And a unit should identify expenditure items for state and local physical recovery funds that will trigger fewer UG process requirements. That'll free up general fund revenues that will not trigger UG um, requirements. And UG is federal uniform guidance that's been out for about two to three years now, and it covers reporting, auditing, your policies, uh, some other things, but especially procurement. Uh, we already follow those for social services and for all of our FEMA stuff, so we're aware. Um, uh, we also recommend that we claim the $10 million revenue loss. Um, doing that allows the local government to use the funds for the provision of services for any governmental services that are authorized by state law. Um, it's not that simple, but it is. A provision means something such as the governing board's not eligible. It's not a direct provision, but that's, that's not an issue. We'll, we'll work around that. Um, that we use uh, for expenditures that are clearly allowable by the final rule. Uh, there's very broad language in the final rule, but they give a specific example and say provision of police, fire, and other public safety services. Then we use the expenditures that we know were incurred uh, in compliance with the federal uniform guidance. And the easiest one for that are salary and fringes. Um, the only thing from uniform guidance that applies to salary infringes are policies, and we've already got those in place for social services and FEMA, um, and they apply to all, all uh, employees, including public safety. Um, we use the funds this year. The county's in an annual reporting category. We only have to file a report once a year through March 31st due each April 30th, but it also only allows you to file one report a year. So if we don't get it done this year, we've got to wait another year and the funds wouldn't be free until after June 30th of 23. So we want to accomplish all this this year and we can because the first eligibility date goes back to March of last year and we can use for expenditures July 1st of 21 through My head March is 31st dead. of 22. My head is spinning. <laughs> so the long and the short is we'll, in effect, cut $7 million from the budget of EMS or fire or, or EMS or the sheriff or whatever. We'll replace what we cut with the ARP money that we got. So they're now back whole in their budget. We'll take what we cut and use it for whatever we want to use it for. We've designated affordable housing. And that is a not a, that's a shorthand way around a lot of what he said. There's some more rules than that. Right. That's the net effect of right. what happened. Right. And what what you'll see, and and this is the last part, is the difference between the CARES Act and the rescue plan is the guidance says 
you have to put this in a separate fund, not in your general fund. So it will be a special revenue fund, just like 911 or sanitation. And you have to spend that money out of that fund. Um, so we're recommending we use it for sheriff detention, communications, and emergency management because those numbers work through the end of the Feb the, through the end of the next payroll. Um, but those expenditures will not show in the general fund for this year. They'll show <laughs> in the special revenue fund. So when you look at your reports and when you look at the audit for the general fund, the sheriff detention center communications and emergency managers are going to be under budget by eight months worth of salary and fringes. But doing it this way, it'll isolate it to those four departments. It'll isolate it to one year and we'll only have to deal with the audit work related to this grant for one year. Then after June 30th, as Bobby said, whatever you saved in the general fund, up to you as to the use. So all of that is that we had asked you to adopt the grant project ordinance that follows the summary. Any further, any questions today? Uh, <laughs> I think I he's made it after that one. <laughs> I think he's made it about as simple as it can be made. It's still uh, Brunswick stew, but I'm, I am following it. <laughs> That's right. And uh, yeah. it's salaries and fringes for people that need it. Uh, you know, we're very fortunate we have good morale in these four departments, but this is certainly going to help. I'm, I'm for it. Yeah, in essence, we're going to use the American Rescue Plan money to cover the designated and identified expenses in EMS, communication, detention, and sheriff, all part of public safety. The money that we don't spend there is then freed up with less restriction that we can apply for affordable right. and or essential right. housing projects. Yep. Okay, yep. I got that. All right. What's well, a pleasure of the board? Move, Move to adopt. There's a motion on the floor by Commissioner House to adopt the grant project. <coughs> It is seconded by Commissioner Bateman. Further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like aye. sign. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Chairman, that brings us to item nine on the agenda. That's the discussion of the selection of the affordable housing private partner. Um, for the sake of those that are listening, we've had multiple meetings. The CIP has met, the board has met to discuss this. They've asked the potential private partners questions. They've received uh, presentations from the partners. We've had the written submissions from the private partners, all in our efforts to move forward with a uh, affordable housing project to use the grant funds or the funds that the legislature provided to us to do that. So tonight we've whittled it down to the two potential private partners. Uh, you all heard from them on Thursday, uh, asked questions of them, whatever questions you had on Thursday. You have all the submissions from them. Um, and with that, it's now in your hands to make a decision on what direction you'd like to go. Um, I think they're all here. I'm looking around and I don't know if you have other questions, but if you do, then there's someone here that can answer them. That was my, that was my comment, Bobby, uh, before we opened it up for discussion is if any of that, my fellow commissioners had any additional questions they might ask of the uh, two two groups. Mr. Chairman, I would yes, like sir. to say once again, thank you to, to, to both of you. We, we really appreciate it. We're done very professionally. Once again, uh, can't be said enough the work that you put into this, and we certainly appreciate the, the efforts that you've made. Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, Vice Chair. Yeah, I would echo those sentiments. Very impressed with, with both Same. organizations, quality of presentation, quality of uh, representation experience very very good very very good stuff absolutely i think we've had some extremely um good conversations we've asked some tough questions and both have uh, answered those and i think we've uh, vigorously uh, looked at uh, both of these plans uh pretty thorough so with that being said um i'll um open the floor uh well I'll yield to uh commissioner ross you motioned to me I'll well I, if i may yeah yes sir uh, just again build on my comment following vice chairman overman i probed 
pretty hard, both organizations looked hard at skills, capabilities, staff, experience. And I'm going to tell you, I struggled. I struggled like crazy because I saw, I thought we saw, in fact, I believe we saw two extremely qualified, solid companies. And reflecting on it and discussing other alternatives, utilizing the funds within the statute and so forth. Um, frankly, I've come up with an idea that I would like to propose to the board in the form of a motion, if I may, and then obviously open that up for discussion. Um, and that in, in this will include both companies, if you listen to the motion that I would like to make. First, I move that we select Coastal Affordable Housing as our private partner to construct affordable housing units in Dare County, subject, subject to negotiation of an agreement that is satisfactory to this board. And that is in pursuit of or pursuant to the provisions of Session Law 2021, Senate Bill 105, Section 24.3. Further, that we as a board direct our chairman and county manager to meet with representatives of Woda Cooper to discuss their interest in developing the Bowser Town site for affordable housing. This motion would incorporate the strengths of both parties, both organizations. We have a substantial multi-year expansive uh, charter placed before us. And in my opinion, my view, we would be able to frankly take advantage of two outstanding organizations that could bring a lot of good to Dare County and its citizens that we continue to see and hear in so dire need of affordable, safe, clean housing. So that is the motion I'd like to put before the board. I will second that motion, and I would like to echo what you said. I think we have two extremely good, I mean, fantastic companies that we've been working with. And uh, if we could get both of them on board, especially with the Bowser Town project, which is something we've struggled with a little bit, <laughs> just a, a little, little bit. just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> oh, I, and I think that's a really good equitable solution. So I, I'm totally in favor of that. Okay, there is a motion on the floor by Commissioner Ross, and it's been seconded by Commissioner Tobin. And I will open the floor for further discussion. I think it's an excellent motion. I'm very satisfied with it. I am too. Uh, I don't know what vehicle we would have to hear their input at this tonight, or if it's just something we'll have to wait. I, 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 I would like to hear from them, uh, particularly Woda with uh, Bowser Town, because uh, there's some light tech money there that's going to that going to go a long way. <laughs> I just would like to know how they feel, if that's a fair question. Well, I don't know that that's proper. I don't know that's, I don't know that's yeah. proper. We'll, pass to it. we'll schedule time we'll yeah. immediately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because we're anxious to move on both parts. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. Commissioner House. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm liking that motion. I think that's a, that's a good uh, <laughs> equitable uh, situation on on both uh, both parties and also both projects we've got going on. So I, I, I'd be in total agreement with. All right. Any further questions? Any further comments? Then those in favor of that motion that was presented by Commissioner Ross and seconded uh, by Commissioner Tobin uh, signify by saying aye. 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 So, as opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you, gentlemen. Right. Chairman, that brings us to item 10 on the agenda. That's the consent agenda. On the consent agenda, you have the approval of the minutes, the tax collector's report, the advertisement for the 2020 tax year liens, our transportation program additional grant award and change order from the NCDOT CARES Act round four. Move Pleasure approve. of the board. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Commissioner Tobin. Second by Couch. Seconded by Commissioner Couch. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. Like, opposed like sign? Motion carries unanimous. Next, Mr. Chairman, are your board appointments. You have one. It's the Commission for Working Watermen. The term of Alana Harrison, who is the fish house dealer seat, expires in March. 
she would like to be reappointed for another three-year term, and you have no other applications. All right. Move to approve. A motion on the floor by Commissioner House to approve. Second. I'll second it. Second by Commissioner Tobin. Further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. like sign. Motion carries unanimous. And that'd be your agenda, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, County Manager. That brings us to item 12 on the agenda, and that's County Manager's business and Commissioner's business. Commissioner House, will you kick that off this evening, please? Yeah, I'll be more than happy to, uh, Mr. Chairman. And once again, I want to thank y'all for uh, having me on uh, virtually. Uh, if, if it was any way possible that I could be there in person, I would be, but unfortunately, I can't make it quite this evening. Um, a couple of things. Uh, we talked about the striped bass. I understand what, what's going on. I'm going to try my best to see if we can't get some, something moving on that. Um, it, it's kind of like under the gun. If this problem would have been brought to us, uh, like I said, in, back in November of 2020, it would have been a whole lot easier. Uh, but it's going to be under the gun, but we'll try to do what we can. Um, also coming up in this uh, meeting is also uh the southern flounder amendment three uh it has been uh approved by uh the uh deq secretary and also by um the legislative in in raleigh so it's just a vote to to put it all finalized uh same thing for the amendment two for the shrimp um the one thing that we were focused on, on the shrimping amendment was the shutting down of the waters around uh uh, Oregon Inlet and uh, Roanoke Island uh, in the sounds. And with that amendment too, we got that taken out of it. It's been approved by D the Secretary of DEQ and also by the Raleigh, Raleigh legislation. So once it comes back and they do a final vote, that secures that we're going to have open shrimping waters around Roanoke Island. Um, also, our day in history in 1935, Everybody knows about no-fly zones for aircraft. And in 1935 was the first no-fly zone issue. And that first no-fly zone was over the White House. Now, you would think that would be for national security. No, it was because President Roosevelt kept getting awoken by, at night by planes <laughs> flying over the White House. So that's how no-fly zones have now been initiated. <laughs> So I just wanted to pass that on to you, a little bit light, lighthearted uh, day in history. Um, but, uh, yeah, like I said, with uh, a, lot of, a lot of things going on in the fisheries right now. And uh, also I want to thank uh, both uh, Coastal and Woda. Y'all gave excellent, excellent uh, presentations. It, and like I said, it's a very tough decision. Um, but y'all did an excellent job. And I, I look forward to working with both of you here in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner House. Commissioner Ross has a question for you. Sir. Sure. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Thank you for that on the, the bass question. I'm, I'm back to my original point, and I would ask a small favor of you if you could. Sure. It is completely inconceivable to me that the other side making these rules, I presume it's there's a lot of alphabet soup in, in that resolution, so I'm, I'm assuming it's the FM, MFC Marine Fisheries Commission Mm -hmm. Correct. What? And it's what and is it's their the, biologists that are saying it's okay? Well, that's what I'm looking for. What have <laughs> they said? This is the clear, unassailable logic for fishing in this tiny area with an equal amount during spawning when we will take out tens of thousands of striped bass. Again, to me, it, an uninitiated, it seems inconceivable. So if you could establish for us. <laughs> this is their point of view, and I'm not putting you as the representative of them. No, no, I just, no. I, 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 I just can't figure out why, why would this you're not going to be happy when we've been talking yeah. about this group well, for how many years now? I know, but <laughs> did they simply say because we said so? If it's as simple as that, then I think we ought to know that because well, I'm all for point. the resolution, by the right. way. Well, here, here's, a, here's another kink to it. Uh, this past year, the marine fisheries said for striped bass up in the Roanoke River, they were going to only open it for one week to cut down the quotas or the allocations. They fished in one week, and they doubled what they did the year before. Well, that's what I read in Mr. Thatcher's memo. And it, again, yeah. 
was inconceivable to me. So I'll stop there. No, Thank I, you. I understand. Mike. All right, moving forward, um, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just continue for just one other moment regarding the rockfish, as okay. I call them, which Absolutely. a lot of folks that come down here from other places call them stripers. Mm -hmm. uh, having a season during the spawn, as we were just saying, makes absolutely no sense at all for a biomass that they can consider to be in danger. Especially so for a con confined spawning area like the upper Roanoke River, which is what we're dealing with. And the only reason they don't go further up the Roanoke River is because of two dams up there ahead of them. It's like shooting fish in a barrel, pun intended. It makes about as much sense as a football bat. And we see this, unfortunately, time and time again out of these folks. You just makes you wonder when it's going to end. And that's all I have. Thank you, uh, Vice Chairman. Commissioner Bateman. Commissioner Bateman's just happy to be here. <laughs> We're happy to be here. <laughs> We're glad you're here too, pal. And I'm, I'm very pleased with the uh, decision and guys, I'm just going to tell you, this has been a long, I mean, how long have we been dealing with this on the housing thing? Long. We've been talking and talking and talking. Just and over talking. two years or just yeah. over two yeah. years. Well, this is the board that is take some action. Amen. In fairness. And, and, and yeah, that's, absolutely. that's a great thing back here, but I, it's been a pleasure to, um, to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Cal. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, been a whirlwind here. Uh, I have a sense of closure, but I know we've still got a long way to go on it until we actually see some dirt moved and some more stuff. But I'm excited and just a little bit relieved here. Uh, <clears throat> 600, the jug handle bridge, locals down there prefer to call it the fish hook bridge. I mean, there is a like difference. It. <laughs> jug handle, fish, well, always the fishing community. Uh, they now have, six, they're up to 600 people gonna uh want to run across that bridge and uh the exposure we're gonna get is certainly gonna be statewide is, is gonna be good and and i know there's some angst about the uh uh roundabout and some of the other issues but i mean these these are engineers and that's what engineers do they engineer and, and i think we need to get behind these guys and, and thank them for what what they're doing you know it's it, when, when you're on an island with one road, you're going to have some problems. You're going to have check-in. You're going to have several thousand people going to want to get in their cottage, in their cottage, by golly, you know, by four o'clock. And then you're going to have a mass of people trying to get out of here on Saturdays and Sundays in the afternoon. So, yeah, there's going to be some issues there. But if you have to tolerate it, in my mind, for, you know, a, a few hours one day and a few more hours the next day uh, for not 12 months, but for, you know, maybe six, seven months, I can deal with that. I, I want what that bridge is going to bring to this county, the prestige that it's bringing it. The, the, we're finding a way in partnership with the feds and the states and our and state and ourselves to rectify, you know, what is a hugely dynamic geologic process. And we're building bridges to get around. This is going to help getting Merlot off the, off, off, off of our, uh, having to take aspirin for all the time. So I'm, I'm excited with what's going on there. And I look with this, I look forward to that. Uh, when this happens here, first or second week of March is still up in the air a little bit. It all hinges on construction. Fortunately, they're going to have a good week. And uh, so bring it. Uh, and thank you, Chairman, for bringing up about the uh, uh, boys down there in Carteret County. Uh, three of those kids, uh, Noah Starn, Starn and, uh, Styron, excuse me, my Outer Bank Starn. I saw one guy spell it Stein, S T E I N. It's hard to keep up with that vernacular. But, you know, it's, it's often been said, what's the difference between Duck and Southport? And a lot of people say, well, roughly 200 miles. There's just not a lot of difference. I mean, all the, those three, three of those kids had roots and adders. Uh, Cole, uh, he's, he's on his vulture line, uh, Styron. Uh, uh, his uh, great, great, oftentimes the, the old timers would marry down sound and uh, 
Then, of course, uh, Daily Shepherd. I mean, the dailies were real big in uh, the life-saving service before running the U.S. Coast Guard. So, it, you know, it still hurts. And uh, But, you know, we are people of faith, and uh, good, good can come out of uh, absolute tragedy. And one of the uh, I tried to keep up with the service that was going on down there in Cedar Island, and there was a, something very poignant that was said. And uh, uh, one of the relatives, one of the, I believe it was almost a direct relative, but one of those children said, the healing is in the giving. She was going to uh, reconcile this tragedy by service. And I was just so uh, floored by that. It was just wonderful hearing that it's going to take some time but those boys will be forever dear in our hearts they the the impact will fade away but the memories and the appreciation and the respect and the love will not and uh well said commissioner okay thank you that, that that'll do it thank you commissioner Tobin. um i don't know did i give any pictures this week i didn't think so <clears throat> the the dredge <clears throat> is entering the painting stage. So we're, there's we're, no. we're referring to the dredge as Miss Katie now. It's beyond the dredge okay, phase, okay. I, Miss Katie. I correct myself. Miss Katie, <laughs> Miss Katie is putting on her makeup. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I sure hope. And she will be I putting sure. on her makeup for the next couple of weeks. I sure so hope it in the pink hole. <laughs> so it's, uh, there won't be a whole lot of updates on mechanical issues. Uh, everything is in the United States mechanically. Uh, there's one item that's in customs that hasn't cleared customs yet. And uh, if, if you can believe this, the probably the longest lead time aisle, uh, item is GFI circuit breakers. And they won't be available. Hopefully, uh, they'll be here by mid-April. Um, but with that said, they can use regular circuit breakers in the meantime. But they do. there is an issue with them. <laughs> um, Along the lines of the youth down there, oh, thank you, Bob, for recognizing them again. And I don't know <laughs> if you all know what the East-West banquet is that we have every year between the charter fleets and the other, any boat that wants to participate. Uh, the East-West is they, the captains split up into teams and they fish for marlin all year and whoever catches the most marlin wins. Well, the East-West boys are, are doing a fundraiser um, for an organization that's been f formed down there. And if anybody in the room would like to donate to that organization to help support those kids and the family, one of the kids and parent that died were fairly wealthy people and they've uh, denied any assistance and want the monies that are given to be given to the rest of the kids and their families. So uh, I'm just putting it out there. If you want to donate any amount whatsoever, uh, just contact me and uh, I'll be happy to direct you in the right way. Thank you, Commissioner. Yep. Um, Harry Schiffman's in the audience tonight. He's part of the Oregon Inlet Task Force. Harry, would you ever thought this happened with the dredge in your lifetime? <laughs> <laughs> Harry was instrumental in it. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if you'd indulge me for just a moment, the community lost another uh, friend who's been here for quite a while, more than 20 years. His, uh, he lived in uh, Kill Devil Hills. His name was Patrick Kelly. He was the general manager of Nags Head Golf Links. Patrick passed away about a week and a half ago. He was only 45 and he's survived by his wife, Karen, who some of you may know is daughter of one of ours, Buster Nunnemaker, and two young children. So Did you say he was only 45? 45, oh. yes, yes. Yeah. And um, mm. he, would been, he had been struggling with a long illness and uh, passed away a week and a half ago. His funeral was last Friday. And I just wanted to express again, I was there and, and our sympathies for, for loss of such a young man. Thank you. Um, I look forward to our friends from Bright Spring and the hospice side, perhaps at our meeting on the 7th or the 21st of March. Uh, speaking of March, I wanted to call out that it is Meals on Wheels Month, and they are seeking volunteers to participate, ride along, and see the delivery in our community. And uh, I've done it before. I'm going to do it again this year. And if you all can 
can do that on your schedules, I would encourage you to do so. You get to see up close and personal the human side of one-on-one, -on -one, how we reach people who are shut in and can't get out, and it's it's really terrific. It 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 really is. Uh, we're going to be meeting tomorrow. Some of us with our friends on the Mantio Town Board of Commissioners regarding the potential Bowser Town site. So optimistic that those meetings will go well. And finally, I'm going to look at my friend, Ms. Hester. Do we have any photo that we were going to put up? Yes. <gasps> of the gold goodness. medal winners. There they are. <laughs> uh, the, the goofy guy with the yellow glasses and the guy in the white sweatshirt will be self-admitting for psychiatric <laughs> counseling. Man, yo, we man, were, we went into the ocean today as part of the Special Olympics Polar Plunge. So ignore the two guys and look at the ladies in the blue t-shirts. They're the ones. <laughs> they're the smart are, ones. They're the ones. No, they went in too. Oh, did they? The lady <laughs> on the far left, with where my right arm is around her shoulder, is uh, is brave and went into the water, and she absolutely did. So hats off to her. It's a special cause, guys. We do it every year. Special Olympics, drawing funding and attention for the athletes here in Derrick County. So thank you, Commissioner Bateman. Just about. Way of uh, could you inform me what was the water temperature today? 44 degrees, 44 balmy degrees in the ocean. It was cold, mm. y'all. You're lucky it was, it was a warm day. You guys should have been there. That's all I have, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ross. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, can I inter interrupt just for a second? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I failed to mention this, and in, in my deepest apologies, uh, <laughs> when it was brought forward, a, a lot of the people were recognizing that it passed away. I failed to recognize, and I've got it in my notes, and I failed to do it, not my, my deepest apologies. Uh, this past weekend, uh, we lost uh, Dottie Fry. Uh, she was a, uh, a past uh, Register of Deeds in Dare County, and uh, my, my heart and uh, prayers go out to the Fry and to the uh, Bass Knight family, and I just wanted to make sure we got that out there. Thank you much. Thank you, Commissioner uh, House, for uh, reminding us of that. Appreciate it. All right, that brings us to uh, county manager. What do you have? I don't have anything, Mr. Chair. I'm like, what? Whoa. Uh -huh. what? <laughs> what? Make sure you make sure you put that in the calendar. It's that <laughs> it's that three day weekend. That's exactly. Right. <laughs> um, a public information officer, Miss Hester. Do you have anything for us? No, sir. All right. Mr. Clawson, our finance director, you have anything else for us? No, sir. All right. Well, thank you all. It's a very good meeting this evening. I will uh, ask someone to entertain a motion to adjourn until 9 a.m. on March the 7th. So moved. Motion on the floor by Commissioner House. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Ross and Bateman. Further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. Motion carries unanimously.